Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Amy. And I'm Hannah. And thanks for joining us for our latest episode. This episode features highlights from one of our Cicerone live events that we hosted in the summer of 2020. Seasoned long distance walker and guidebook author Paddy Dillon joined us to discuss lightweight backpacking, including tips for starting out backpacking, lightweight gear and food. We also spoke about Paddy's early backpacking trips and how to wild camp responsibly. Paddy Dillon is one of Cicerone's most prolific guidebook writers. He has written over 90 guidebooks and walked and trekked all over the world, including all of the UK national trails. The range of his travel-related work includes guidebooks to the Southwest Coast Path, the Pennine Way, multiple guides to walking and trekking on the Canary Islands, as well as colder climates, including Greenland's Arctic Circle Trail and walking and trekking in Iceland. Paddy is the president of the Backpackers Club and, as you'll soon find out, is a seasoned professional in packing light. So it's hard to plan specific trips at the moment, um, but we thought it's a really good time for looking at kit and thinking about where you might like to go and the sort of equipment you'd like to take with you. Paddy was really keen to show us bits of kit when we did our live event, including his lightweight camping stove that he was very proud of. And you can see it on the video, but unfortunately it did create a little bit of sound disturbance. Amy has edited most of it out, but if you hear a bit of crackling and clunking in the background when we talk about the kit, that's what it is. Yeah, Paddy was very enthusiastic, wasn't he? I think when you talk about kit, everybody gets quite excited and and everybody wants to know what brand of, of kit that he's got when it's a pound lighter or a kilo lighter even. It was also really nice um, to talk to Paddy about his early backpacking trips and asking him about the kind of mistakes that he made when he was younger and how he's learned from those. Um, I think that's a really entertaining part of that live event. And also his love for the Pennine Way is really apparent and just really nice to hear about. And I think is quite inspiring for people who maybe haven't been backpacking before and want to get some tips on how to do that. Well, and Paddy didn't know how to do it. He was pretty much a child and he just started walking and didn't really stop. Hasn't really stopped now, to be honest. But yeah, now he is much more of an expert and he doesn't like making things too difficult for himself. He wants to be focused on the walk and and the view and writing his notes for the guidebook. And he doesn't want to have a massive, heavy backpack for the whole time. So I think that's why you know, packing light and being strict about what you're not taking with you and then getting the lightest possible gear for the essentials that you do want to take with you is is so important to him. And on the event, we had loads of questions from the audience that was made up a lot of Paddy's fans because he's a very popular guidebook writer. We were as well lucky enough to have um, another event with Paddy, a more recent one, where he spoke to us alongside Raina Wynn, all about the Southwest Coast Path and trekking in Iceland. And that was another really lovely event. So if you'd like to hear more from Paddy, you can find that event on our website, on your podcast app or on our YouTube channel. It is available as both a podcast and the video live event. So there's plenty more to explore from Paddy Dillon. Because people... People just love Paddy Dillon. As soon as we mention that we've got Paddy Dillon coming on on a podcast or a live event, everyone gets really excited because although he's he's such a, a down to earth chap, he's just got such an incredible knowledge of walking trails in the UK, uh, especially, but the whole world really. He's just walked everywhere, and I think at Cicerone we maybe think about the books that he's written, but I mean. He goes walking for pleasure as well. And he's walked in many places that he doesn't even have Cicerone guides to. So he's, yeah, he is a source of masses of amount of information. And we will try and get him back for as many live events as we possibly can. I think we could just do a whole thing where it's just Paddy Dillon, couldn't we? Paddy Dillon podcast. Yeah. Well, even Raina would be part of that because she loves Paddy Dillon in, in her book, in The Salt Path and in The Wild Silence. She talks a lot about Paddy Dillon as if he's some sort of superhero. And uh, and it's quite funny when you realise that he is just, you know, a normal, humble, lovely chap. So it's about time that we move on and hear from Paddy. But we just want to say before that, thank you to all of the listeners who have given us feedback on the podcast, whether that's 
on our Facebook groups, Cicerone Connect, or whether that's by email. So we've had some really lovely comments on both. And, you know, um, one email in particular came in on a Friday afternoon from a lovely man called Barry. And yeah, it's a lovely thing to receive on a Friday afternoon and really lifted mine and Hannah's spirits. So thank you so much for that. It's just so nice to have the feedback that we get from from people. So, you know, you might think that we get so many emails, we don't read them or we don't take notice, but actually we we love them and they make us smile and then we forward them to the team so that the whole team gets to to smile about them. It's it's really nice. We do really appreciate it. Welcome, Paddy. Hello there. First of all, I just wanted to ask, what is it about backpacking that you clearly love so much? I guess it's the difference between just going out for a day's walk, in which case you'd probably be driving or going by train or bus. Um, You'll spend hours in a vehicle, as well as hours on the hills or in the countryside. With backpacking, you go out, you stay out, you're more a part of the countryside, you're, you're more involved in the terrain, because it's not just going there in daylight hours, but it's working through those nighttime hours as well. You know, you put your tent up, everything goes dark, you go to sleep. Should there be a howling gale in the night, you've got, you're the one who has to sort it out. No one else is going to come and deal with it for you. And it really does give you that proper connection with the landscape that you're passing through. But the thing is, you wake up, you're still in on the trail, you're still in the area, you keep going through the day and you'll end up somewhere else. And it's that great variety of, you know, you're not doing a circular walk back to your car. You're actually walking away and further away to wherever you're heading. And only at the end do you need to come back home. And I think that's what makes it different than any other type of walking. You're out there for a reason and you stay out there and you look after yourself while you're out there too. Yeah, the idea of kind of self-sufficiency, I think, is really wonderful. You mentioned overnight and camping and that sort of thing. So is there a particular experience that you've had? You know, I'm sure you've had many, but one that stands out as a particularly wonderful overnight experience. Oh, definitely. I mean, you can't beat turning up in a place when it's actually getting dark, it's cloudy. You know where you are. It's just you can't see anything. You pitch the tent, you cook your meal, you turn in for the night, and in the morning you unzip the, the, the fly sheet, pop your head out, and for the first time realise where you've been staying and it might be snowcat peaks all around you know wonderful colours which you didn't get the night you arrived but it's been there it's just been out of sight I love that sort of thing but I'm just as happy to be there on a nice calm evening watch the sun go down you know quietly turn in and then get up in the morning watch the sun come up you don't know what sort of weather you're going to get so you don't know what the experience is going to be until it happens so it's that thing again it's because you're out there and you're involved in the landscape and you know you're part of the terrain if you like it's just you and a thin sheet of fabric against whatever the world is going to throw at you you're an expert in packing light yes <laughs> Yeah, you know, you've mentioned having all the right kit and I wondered if you could run us through a kind of kit list to take with you. If you'd seen if you'd seen me when I was 16 on my first backpack, the gear I was carrying, I was bow legged with the weight of it. I, I was bent double with the weight of it. When I took the pack off and it crashed to the ground, I swear the ground shook. And that was <laughs> at the tender age of 16. Ever since then I've been trying to adapt and refine and you know get something that is more and more comfortable to carry I mean uh, the bottom line would be I'd be quite happy if I wasn't carrying anything but if I'm going to do this sort of thing I've got to take things with me so I've decided personally just speaking for myself it's in my interest to take things that are lightweight low bulk go into a small pack and are barely noticeable on my back so when most people think of backpacking, they think of some, you know, great strapping guy with a massive, huge pack, you know, sort of stretching out in order, pots and pans clanging on the outside of it, big rolls of sleeping mats and sleeping bags and tents, all that sort of thing. With me, it's more little day sack, you know, just a day sack that goes on my back. Anyone who meets me thinks I'm out for the day. 
they don't think I'm out yes. for three months. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just because I've, I've made the decision, do you know what, if there's a choice between the heavy stuff and the light stuff, I'll get the light stuff. I'll tell you one thing though, if you end up with a big wallet full of money like this, um, going for lightweight camping, you end up with a lightweight lit as well. It's all gone. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, you, know you, you won't get an easy ride with this. You'll have a lot of frustration finding stuff that doesn't quite work, trying to get something better, paying through the nose for it, you know, or finding someone else who's already going through this mill and say, I'll take that off you, you know, at a discount. You, you can build up your kit, you can chop and change, but you do have to put a lot of thought in, otherwise you will end up wasting a lot of time, wasting a lot of money. Basically, you know, it can get quite frustrating. So the idea is to talk to people who've already been there and done it. And I suppose, you know, you mentioned being president of the Backpackers Club. You turn up at one of their meets, they've been through the mill, they know what works. They have very strong opinions about this gear versus that gear. And just to turn up and plonk your tent next to theirs, and how do you find these tents, this sleeping bag? I mean, what's that stove all about? They'll tell you straight and then you've got information that you won't get from reading a catalogue or browsing a website. You're actually getting it from the person who's using it. But all I can say is I've done my level best to refine my kit from the age of 16 and I'm still working at it. I may never get there, but, you know, like I say, I'll do my level best. <laughs> What do you think when you were 16 and starting out, what was the biggest mistake that you made? The biggest mistake was probably taking all the wrong gear. I mean, I didn't have the money to buy gear, so I had to beg, steal and borrow. Mostly borrow from my uncle Gerard. He gave me a sleeping bag, which the stench that came out of it, I had no idea what was going on. But I eventually turned the thing inside out and gave it a good shake. And the entire foot end was so mildewed, it just disintegrated and flew in all directions. And it was stuffed with kapok, which is not something you would normally think of stuffing a sleeping bag with. You know, hollow fibre, down, anything but kapok. It was just like an enormous sponge. But it almost looked as if he'd spent a few nights in it himself with muddy boots on. But he said, hey, here's a sleeping bag, you'll be grand, you know. I honestly wish I'd been able to have a decent sleeping bag, a decent tent, decent everything. But like I say, I was carrying far too much. It was all the wrong gear. And it's only when, you know, I had the money to buy the gear that I could actually stop and treat myself bit by bit to decent gear through the decades. I suppose <laughs> <laughs> it's that middle ground, isn't it, between, yeah. you know, having the right gear that could be absolutely amazing but it yeah. does come at cost um, yeah. and I know that lightweight gear in particular can be really expensive yeah. so you know how do you balance that? You have to look at what it's intended for first and foremost so if you are going to go somewhere you are going to end up camping in boulder fields in very exposed locations freezing cold at night hurricane winds don't get a lightweight tent that needs a lot of secure pegging points get a proper expedition tent it will break your back but it will keep you alive if you were doing a standard national trail in britain in the summertime it's not going to get too cold it may get wet but you'll survive it'll be nicer the next day or the day after you can get away with lightweight everything so it's a case of saying you know i'm going to such a place i need rock solid gear or i'm going to such a place lightweight gear will do it because i'm not expecting horrendous conditions or really desperately bad terrain underfoot but you have to you know i mean if i go to iceland i'll take three types of footwear if i go anywhere in the uk one type of footwear and that's the difference it's i'm going to a different place i need to be able to walk through wet ground stony ground and over glaciers I don't need to walk over glaciers in this country, not in summer. <laughs> so I don't need glacier gear. I mean, I have a lightweight ice axe, but it still weighs 400 grams. <laughs> I don't need that in summer in Britain, but I do need it if I go to Iceland in the summer, because at some point I'll be having great fun on a glacier. And just to have a lightweight ice axe will make all the difference there. So yeah, it's a case of getting the right gear for the right place. And sometimes that gear will not be lightweight. You know, you'll have to get something very heavy and durable if you're in an extreme location. 
I suppose if you're tight on money, which is the thing that you think people should prioritise? Um, that, that all depends. I mean, you have to ask yourself, do I want to be comfortable all day, but I don't mind roughing it at night, in which case you could skimp on the tent. Or if you said, I want a really desperately comfortable night to recover from the rigours of the day, then you might skimp on your waterproofs and your footwear and, and put all your money into your tent. But at the end of the day, it, I think it's more a case of if you do get interested in backpacking, get whatever gear you can and then as you're using it decide which things you need to refine personally it might be your backpack you might say do you know i'll get rid of the heavy backpack i can get a lighter one and still get everything in or i can get rid of the heavy tent i'm confident now that a lightweight tent will be good enough for me you know i can get rid of the big bulky sleeping bag and go for one that just keeps squashing down and down it's called down for a reason it goes right down and you know just refine something one at a time and if you don't if you if you say went online and said oh type in quality down sleeping bags you'd be surprised at just how much they cost but then again there'll be somebody somewhere trying to get rid of a quality down sleeping bag because they've gone for something else and you'll get it for half price a third of the price and um, so it's a case of do you want it brand new will you accept second hand and again with something like the backpackers club whenever they have a sizable meet um, usually in the winter and, the, and the, the spring they will end up with a table full of things for sale members offloading things members buying things and you can get some real bargains there mm -hmm. you know it's like pe people who they have opinions about the stuff they're getting rid of i'm getting rid of it because but you know in all other respects it's fantastic fine you know what are you asking for it 50 quid i'll give you 20 done you can't beat it you know a bit of horse trading there over a tabletop <laughs> yeah that's such a lovely sense of community as well are you still refining your kit then? Are you still getting rid of stuff? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm okay where I am at the moment. When I had the hard think today, you know, is there anything right now that I would throw out in favour of something better? I can't actually think of anything, you know, I mean, the stuff I've got, you know, it's just, I can pick these things up, tent, you know, I mean, I keep the poles separate because they don't fold down, you know, so tent, poles, just over a kilo. And I'm thinking, can I really go less than that? I mean, you know, if I went to a tent that was like 500 grams, what am I going to lose? You know, probably a lot of, you know, stability and durability. So I'm fine where I am with that. You know, I will not give up the sleeping mat. Now that's inflatable, so it will go that thick. You can just get closed foam mats. That's fine if you like them, if you're comfortable with them. I want a bit more comfort and I'm willing to pay for it. But tent, sleeping bag and mattress, less than two kilos so if you think about it i have a day sack i'm going out for a day's walk if i suddenly think well, i could spend the night out two kilos and i'm covered tent sleeping bag mattress and i'll be extremely comfortable it gets more complicated if you start thinking about stoves and food for the night and which stove which fuel and all this sort of thing but again i would have in some instances i'd have a choice between one and another so I may go for the uh, the meth stove, it'll work off meths. So that's it, or have, believe it or not, a gas stove. It doesn't look like a gas stove, it's in a device. Tiny, bag. yeah. When it comes out, it's all folded up. But if I wanted to take a gas stove, all I need is a cylinder to screw this on top of. And I'm in business for cooking because the whole thing just unwinds. All the prongs come out that the pan sits on top of. And then this thing just screws directly onto a cylinder. And there we go, one gas stove. And it, it, it would fit in your pocket and no one would even know you had a stove in your pocket. And, and then again, if you don't like something that's on the market, you're perfectly entitled to make your own. There's a, a big trade, a big sort of interest in DIY gear. You know, people just want the raw materials and I'll make it myself. And I've done that sort of thing quite successfully. This is another question and it's related to stoves. Um, people are asking, how do you carry food for seven days? What you end up with when you've bought all your lightweight gear is your base weight. That's just your gear. That's what's going on your bike. Once you start adding food, and here we go, a week's supply of muesli, that's a kilo. 
you know, I mean, that that is just like a one kilo weight. And that's going nowhere till you've eaten it. But the joy is, you know, after a week, it doesn't weigh anything. All you're left with is the wrapper. And of course, you won't dispose of that wrapper on the moorland. You'll take it down to a bin or you'll bring it home. When it comes to things like, you know, choice of tea, coffee or whatever, it's individual servings. You work out how much tea and coffee you're going to drink. Pack exactly that amount. Don't take the whole coffee jar for a weekend. You know, but thinking about food is another process altogether because what I eat isn't the same as what you eat or what anyone else eats. We've all got our favourites. We've all got our limits as to how long we're prepared to spend in a howling gale preparing something before we're too hungry to even eat it. So you, again, you learn through a process of just doing these things as to what works best for you. So by all means, you know, take a leg of ham and all that. And if it's not working for you, take something dehydrated that you just add water to. You know, it just goes on like that. You'll learn as you go along. But the other thing about food is if you know that you are going to be reaching places on a daily basis where you can try quality local food, you'd be a fool not to try it. You know, that's especially the case abroad. It's your, your chance to try something different. Why take noodles abroad? If you have to take them, but if there's going to be quality food halfway up the mountain every single day on the trail, then dig in and pay the price and, and enjoy it. Or, you know, you balance that against, I'm going somewhere remote. I'm not going to get any sort of access to food for 10 days. Therefore, I need 10 days worth of food in my pack. And you'll probably work out that you're going to need at least a kilo in terms of dehydrated food to keep you well in full up and in good order for trekking per day. So a 10 day walk will be 10 kilos. So if your base weight was six kilos, like I've done a good job on my lightweight packing, six kilos, but I'm going away for 10 days, all of a sudden it's more like 16 kilos. But the joy is, on the 10th day, you're carrying six kilos and some crumpled up wrappers. <laughs> I, sp I suppose that's the importance of cutting out, you know, excess weight, isn't it? So that you have yeah. got the extra space for yeah. important things like food. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the more you can make things low bulk, the smaller the pack is you need to carry. And if you make your food low bulk as well by going exclusively dehydrated and then taking on board local food wherever you can get it then you know the amount of food you need is is quite minimal you can do some fantastic treks i mean if you think of some quality european treks gr20 is exceptionally tough you don't want to be carrying 10 kilos of food on that given that you probably get one or two options a day to buy quality food and then the gr5 the number of huts in the middle of nowhere up a mountain doing three course meals you know, why would you want to be sat there with dehydrated soup and noodles? We've got another question. Would you recommend using trekking poles? Yes, because I've sometimes taken my trekking poles and I, again, I've got lightweight trekking poles. These are black diamond ones in their own little bag. So they're not the, the trekking poles that extend. These ones actually fold up. Um, oh, wow. I've got to clip them together and they only come in a certain length. So you decide whether you want short, medium or long. They're very lightweight. So I don't mind carrying them, even if I end up walking for a month and never use them once. But the one occasion when I might use them, when it's steep and slippery and there's a big cliff edge in front of me, I'll be glad I, I was carrying them. You know, so what I'm doing there is I'm taking something that may be essential, but probably won't be. But when it is essential, I've got it. And I don't mind carrying it because it's so light. My trekking poles, I think, are 300 grams. Now, most people's trekking poles are made of some kind of metal alloy. And they'll probably come in at about 500 upwards. I don't mind carrying 300 grams. It's like a small tub of margarine, you know. And if I need them, they're there. And if I don't, I don't mind. What is one piece of kit that has been your saviour on a trip? Oh, I think in terms of it being a saviour, it's got to be the tent. You know, because when all said and done, you, you know, if you've actually got that sort of two thin sheets between you and the elements, you can take the rough ground. You know, if you've inadvertently forgotten your sleeping bag or it blew away when you hung it up to air or whatever. And if you've just got the tent, 
that's your main safety feature. You can survive a lot with a tent. If you only had a sleeping bag and it was pouring with rain, you would probably not survive that. Um, but then again, when it comes to survival, I think most people who, you know, have had good experience of, of sort of wild and mountainous terrain, almost everyone will tell you, you should be able to survive one really bad night out. Second night, that's, that's going to be a desperate struggle. Third night, you're, you're probably losing it there. <laughs> but one bad night is survivable. You know, if it rains, it snows, it hails, uh, and it's dark and you can't do anything except sit there and jump up and down. When it gets light the next day, you can bail out. And you might be desperately unhappy, but at least you survived. But yeah, the tent will save you a lot of trouble. And um, that's your main thing is your shelter. Even in the Alps with all the mountain accommodation they have, I'll still take the tent because you only need to get halfway up a mountain, the weather's looking a bit iffy, you knock on the door of the hut and the guardian says they're full. Not only are they full, they're over full. People are sleeping on the kitchen table tonight. Oh, it's all right, I've got a tent. Great, you're sorted. You know, there's always plenty of room outside, wherever you are. <laughs> Do you have any advice for responsible wild camping? It's illegal in that it's a civil offence. That's an important thing to remember. And when you go wild camping without permission, you've just found a nice grassy patch behind the bushes and you put your tent there. If the landowner turns up, he has every right to ask you to move on. And your only response can be, yeah, I'm sorry, mate, roll up the tent and move on. It, it's one of those things where if you go and camp wild, you leave absolutely no trace. Nobody ever knew you were there. You kept quiet, you kept out of sight. When you left, the grass might be flat, but you fluffed it up again and said, there we go, look at that. That's exactly how I found it. And you walk away. But yeah, it, it's one of these things, you know, it's can I honestly, with my hand on my heart, tell people to go out and break the law? Of course I can't, you know, but people are doing this all the time. And the bulk of them are doing it responsibly. And those who do it responsibly, you'll never even know they were doing it. But if you stand out like an eyesore, you know, bright tent and big crowd of you smashing bottles, having a bonfire, chopping somebody's trees down, you know, scaring all the cattle all night with raucous music. That's not wild camping. That's just wild people going camping. That's completely different. Kind of following up on, you know, awful trips and being stuck out in terrible weather. Another question from the viewers. What was your most memorably disastrous walk? When you were when hiking. I was 16 with all the wrong kit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a combination of, yeah, I had all the wrong kit. I was on part of the Pennine Way. My plan at the age of tender age of 16, I, I lived about six miles from the Pennine Way. So I thought six miles I'm on the Pennine Way and then I'll follow it north. And then when I get far enough north, I'll cut off to the Lake District, climb a load of fells, uh, come back through the Yorkshire Dales and there you go, job done, you know. Um, my summer holiday all used up from school. So I set off and going up the Pennine Way was, uh, I was doing okay. And then I got to Dufton. I made an early morning start thinking, climb onto Crossfell and then cut off for the Lake District. You know, so it, today's the day I leave the Pennine Way. And it was cloudy on top. And it wasn't that I, you know, was a, a bad navigator. It's just that I didn't navigate. You know, I went up Knock Fell and instead of turning left on top, I went straight over the back. And believe me, there's nothing on the back of Knock Fell except chopped up peat bogs and the River Tees. And it's only when I find the River Tees, I thought that's not Cross Fell or the Dunfells, that's, that's a river. So I waded across the River Tees thinking, I know I'm on the River Tees, I just have no idea which part of the River Tees I'm on. I find a track. I bailed out, it took me to Gary Gill. I thought, oh, that's on the Pennine Way, but I'm on the wrong side of Cross Fell. I need to be on the other side. Now, a sensible person would have pitched their tent at Gary Gill, but I set off up Cross Fell thinking I'll probably get to the summit, you know, but it turned into a hurricane. It poured with rain and I got to Greg's Hut, which is a mountain bothy. And to this day, I cannot tell you why I didn't open the door, walk in and stay there for the night. But no, I carried on. 
and I came down from Crossfell into the Vale of Eden just as it was getting dark. Did I put the tent up? No, I walked right through the night to the Lake District, eventually got to Glen Ribbing, 46 miles from Dufton. Then I put the tent up. The next morning, thinking I'll climb Helvellyn now, I woke up, unzipped the tent, and there were all these shell-shocked people walking around the campsite. And tents were in tatters. And they said, oh, what a storm that was, but I see your tent survived. And I'm like, storm? <laughs> because I was so wrecked after doing that 46 miles without sleep. I slept right through the storm that destroyed that campsite. And mine was the only tent that survived. It wasn't even a good tent, but it survived. Um, but that was a whole day and a night of a complete disaster. But I learned from it, you know, like next time you're up not fell, turn left, don't go straight on. <laughs> you know, when it gets dark, stop. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you, can, yeah. you can pick up a lot from terrible mistakes. And I'm glad I did it all when I was young. Between 16 and 17, I made the bulk of all the mistakes I've ever made in my life in terms of backpacking. And now I'm in the clear, you know, I'm not likely to make any more really desperately bad decisions from now on <laughs> <laughs> that's the hope anyway Unfortunately. Yeah. so I just thought I'd ask you about some of the you know you've walked all the UK national trails and um, we've got a question if you had just one trail to rework which would it be I think I'd always go for the Pennine Way because like I've grown up with that one you know like I said I used to live six miles off it and it was created when I was seven years old and I think I heard about it from that time. People in my family went and walked it. And, you know, it was just one of those things. At some point, you had to walk the Pennine Way. People would actually, in the old days, when I was a teenager, if you were walking on your own, people would chat to you. And they'd often say, are you just walking for pleasure? Or are you walking the Pennine Way? You know, if you were on the Pennine Way. As if, you know, like you could walk the Pennine Way, but it certainly wasn't for pleasure, you know. And then other people would say to you, oh, are you a, a serious walker? And you'd say, oh, yes, you know, I know I'm only like 17, 18. I'm a serious walker, though. And they say, I'll have you walked the Pennine Way? And everything hinged on the yes or no. If you said yes, then oh, a serious walker. And if you said no, just an amateur. You know. But it's a great trail. It's not the same as it was in the 70s when I first walked it. It was absolutely being trodden to death. It's been repaired. And so as far as conditions underfoot, it's not the same trail, but the scenery is the same, the places are the same, and I've always enjoyed it, and I think I always will. So out of all the national trails, if I'd put one at the top, it would be Pennine Way. Thanks to Amy and Paddy for that, and thank you for listening to this latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. Please let us know what you think by leaving reviews on your podcast platform or by emailing us at live at cicerone.co.uk. We'd really appreciate hearing from you. Visit www.cicerone.co.uk to find over a thousand articles, sign up to our newsletter or buy one of our guidebooks. You can subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or on your favourite podcast provider. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. So in the meantime, search for Cicerone Press on Facebook and Instagram. And you can also join our Facebook community group, Cicerone Connect, to connect with other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you soon.